morning. We're in the book of Romans again this morning and uh, continuing our studies in this great book. We're in chapter 10 and going to look at verses 5 through 13. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. Let's bow in a word of prayer. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can, and so goes the poem by Rudyard Kipling, titled, not surprisingly, If. It is about virtue and is inspiring enough that a line from it is inscribed above the entrance to Wimbledon's center court. It ends... If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that is in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. The poem offers wise counsel for young boys, 32 lines of it. If you can keep your head, if you can trust yourself, if you can dream, think, etc. And all Kipling meant by that was good counsel. He was trying to help boys become Englishmen with a stiff upper lip. But when I read it, I can't help but think of human religion. If you can do all these things, you will inherit the earth. If, if. That's religion. All effort and uncertainty. What a contrast that is to Christianity. Believe. The difference between Christianity and religion could not be greater. It's the difference between receiving and achieving, faith and works. That's the contrast that Paul makes in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 13, and he makes it clearly. In verse 4, Paul wrote, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's all. Believes. Then, in the next verse, Paul contrasts righteousness which is by faith with righteousness that is by the law of Moses. A righteousness which is by human effort. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. Leviticus 18 verse 5. That's the testimony of the law. The law gives a hypothetical way of salvation. It wasn't given for salvation, but it gives the way of salvation by works for those who want salvation by works. It shows what a person must do if he or she is to gain heaven by his or her efforts. They must live by it. 
all 613 commandments. Live by them every moment. The law requires more than good effort, more than 60 seconds worth of distance run. It requires perfection. Only Christ has done that. We haven't. We can't. So what the law really shows is our need. That's the reason it was given. Not to give us a legitimate path to salvation, but to show us there is no path to salvation except Christ. And in verse 6, Paul states that God has provided that, provided that way of salvation, what he calls the righteousness based on faith, meaning righteousness that is received through faith. God doesn't require great physical feats from us to obtain his acceptance, simply faith that receives his gift of righteousness. To prove that, Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 12 through 14, where Moses said, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. What Moses was doing with these two quotes, Who will ascend and who will descend is discouraging any idea that God's will is, is hard to find or His will is hard to understand. No, He said in verse 8, the Word is near you. It isn't hidden. It isn't far away. God has made it available. So it isn't necessary to do some superhuman act to learn God's will or attain salvation. Now Moses didn't say to bring Christ down or to bring Christ up. Paul added those two statements, but he didn't add anything that isn't suggested in the passage. Deuteronomy chapter 30 is all about grace. It gives the promise of God circumcising the hearts of Israel so that the Israelites would love the Lord and would live, would be obedient and have eternal life. That's, that's grace. It's not works. That's grace. It's the new covenant that Christ would establish. Moses tells people to obey, but in verse 10... He tells them, you will only be able to obey if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. That's faith. They were to trust in Him. God's revelation of Himself and His will was clear. He brought it near to them. He had revealed everything necessary for faith and life. So Paul wasn't reading anything into Moses' statement. He was actually bringing out its full meaning. He recognized God's grace in it, the the same grace that he preached, the grace of the gospel. God has clearly revealed the way of salvation from the beginning. He brought it near and made it available. So just as Israel was without excuse... In Moses' day, Jews and Gentiles in Paul's day, and mankind in our day is without excuse. We cannot plead ignorance. The revelation has been made known. Christ has come down from heaven. He has been raised from the dead. He has brought salvation to man. The truth is accessible. It's near. All a person must do is believe. So, heroic efforts to find the truth and to gain salvation are not necessary. There's no need to to go and get Christ, to try to uh, uh, produce salvation by our own efforts and works. He He has already come, He has already achieved it, and the Word is near you. But these are just the kinds of things that people think that uh, they must do. 
all kinds of great effort searching for truth. In the 1960s and 17, uh, and 70s, uh, when I was a student, the counterculture was in vogue, very active, and those who were associated, it, associated with it were enamored of the East. And it was popular for young people to follow what was called the hippie trail. And they would follow a route from England across Europe, across the Middle East, through Iran, Afghanistan, and down into India looking for a guru or swami to gain enlightenment. Well, Paul and Moses and the Lord are saying, it's not there. It's not across the globe. It's not far away. It is very near. The word is near you. It's the gospel. So heroic efforts aren't necessary. But these are the kinds of things people like to think that they must do for salvation. Climb up to heaven or go down into the abyss. Man wants to do something. He wants to achieve salvation, which is the righteousness based on the law. It's what Spurgeon called man's strange infatuation with the law. The rich young ruler had that infatuation. What shall I do to inherit eternal life, he asked the Lord. What monumental task must I undertake undertake that that will put me over the top? That's man's religion. And not just Judaism, but among the Gentiles also. You see that. I think, reflected in the old myths. Hercules, for example, took on 12 labors in order to gain purification from his sins. He killed a lion, then a monster. He cleansed the Augean stables. Each each labor became more difficult until finally he went down to Hades to free Theseus. It's a myth, but still it gives the essence of natural religion. Man thinks that he must work and toil, maybe even attempting the impossible to gain heaven. Men even want that. They desire that kind of religion. You see it in places like Rome where pilgrims visit shrines, places like the Scala Sancta, Pilate's steps where tradition has it. He stood when he sentenced Jesus to death. And people will come there. They come from all over the world. I've watched them more than once. And they come and they, they crawl up those steps, climbing on their knees, saying their paternosters as they go at each step. They line up to do that. It's an old practice. Luther did it famously when he was an Augustinian monk seeking rest for his soul. So he went to Rome. He came to those steps. He climbed up those steps on his knees. And when he finally got to the top, he said to himself, who knows whether it is so. After all he had done, and he'd done much more than that when he'd come to Rome and crawl up steps, he still had doubts that he was achieving the righteousness that he was seeking by his own efforts. If, if, was still ringing in his uh, his mind. And, And soon he would learn that he wasn't gaining it by his efforts. He learned that God's righteousness is a gift. It's what we receive through faith. He learned that when he read this very book, the book of Romans. God has not hidden the truth of salvation. It is not necessary to scale the heights or search the depths for salvation. It's no more necessary to do that than it is possible to do that. God has already done everything that is necessary for salvation. And he has revealed it. The word is near you, Paul says. It is available for all who believe. 
It's the word of faith, Paul says, which he and the other apostles were preaching across the globe. In verse 9, Paul <clears throat> gives the content of the word that they preached. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The, that's the gospel. And the response that results in salvation what is, I think, surprising as we read that is, um, is the, uh, the, 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 the way it is, is stated, the order of the response, confess and believe rather than believe and confess. Probably the reason for that order is Paul was following the, the order of the quote from Deuteronomy that he's just given. The word is near, near you in your mouth and in your heart. But... Uh, not a lot can be made out of the order here in verse 9 because in verse 10 Paul reverses it. With the heart a person believes, with the mouth he confesses. Both of these are parts of the same response. Salvation occurs through faith in the heart. And the confession of that arises naturally from the heart that has been changed, from the heart that has been regenerated. We naturally confess what we've already believed. The confession that's made is that Christ is Lord and that He is alive. He has been resurrected. Both statements speak of His person and His work as Savior. They speak of who He is and what He has done. Lord identifies His deity. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the word Lord is the name of God. Uh, a Jewish audience would have recognized that immediately. They would have understand that this meant Jehovah. It, uh, it, it had to be so. He had to be God. We cannot have a Savior unless He is God. The, only in that way, in such a one, could His sacrifice have sufficient force and value to atone for our sins, which are, in their guilt, infinite. Only one of that nature, a divine nature, the deity of the Savior, could account for the weight, the guilt of our sins. Only He could remove it. It took one who is God to do that. But... He also had to be a man in order for his sacrifice to be suitable. Only a man could be a substitute for mankind. And that's what the confession points to in its second part, the Lord's humanity and his sacrifice for us on the cross. God raised him from the dead. Well, that presupposes his death. He raised him because he had died for our sins. He had raised him in order to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And the fact that God raised Christ from the dead is the proof that He has accepted His Son's sacrifice for us. That full atonement has been made. When I say atonement, I'm speaking of the death of Christ and the purpose of that death, which is to satisfy the absolute justice of God, satisfy it completely, and therefore turn away his justice, his wrath from us. He's satisfied him. Atonement has been made. Our sins have been, as the psalmist puts it, separated as far as the east is from the west. The cross is the, the place where atonement was made, where salvation was obtained. We sometimes think of the cross or it is sometimes thought of as a defeat. It wasn't a defeat. It was the victory. And the resurrection is the proof of it. It's the evidence that God accepted the sacrifice that His Son made for us, that it was accomplished when He said it was finished. It definitely was, a fin it was finished. And God proved that historically by raising Christ from the dead. His sacrifice on our behalf has been accepted. Nothing more needs to be done. He now leads us and protects us. 
ensuring that in the end we will enter safely into his heavenly kingdom. We have a living Savior. Not only does the resurrection prove that the sacrifice has been accepted, but that he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father, guaranteeing that every one of his children, every believer, will be secure and brought in to his kingdom. So, in light of that, what more needs to be done? Nothing. That's really what Paul is saying here. Nothing more needs to be done. God has done it all. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can add to the work of Christ. It is finished. And we simply need to receive it by believing in Him. Paul explains this further in verse 10. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Righteousness or justification and salvation are essentially the same thing in in this text. And while the, the heart and mouth are distinguished, they really cannot be separated. John Murray wrote in his commentary on Romans, Confession without faith would be vain, but likewise faith without confession would be shown to be spurious or false. Confession doesn't save, but the saved confess. They declare that they've been saved. And and we confess our faith in various ways. Uh, We do so publicly. We do so in baptism. That is a public confession of faith. That's why we're baptized. It is to give a public confession demonstration that we have been joined to Christ and joined to His people. We do that in baptism. We do that when we take the Lord's Supper on a Sunday night. We are identifying with the Savior, acknowledging that He is the one who saved us and that we, we exist in our salvation moment by moment by Him and Him alone. So we confess Him in those ways. And then, of course, we confess Christ in our conversation with others by giving the gospel to those we know or we meet. Uh, Christians tell others about Christ and salvation and faith in Him. Sometimes we fail to do that. We all do that. Uh, We might hesitate to give the gospel and confess Christ with our mouth before others out of fear that uh, the world will think poorly of us. They'll think we're odd or something like that. So we, we're a little fearful of being embarrassed or being scorned. And I think there are obvious reasons for that. But one reason is we don't appreciate the very subject that we're studying right here. The grace of God and the person of Christ. All that He has done for us. In verse 12, Paul speaks of the the riches that are abounding in Christ for the believer that, uh, that have been given to us, given to us freely by God's grace. Free to us, but at great cost to Him. The shedding of His blood. What did He gain for us? Forgiveness, eternal life, the Holy Spirit. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity actually lives within us. We have the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace, and all these virtues that the Spirit of God produces within us. There is power within us. Christ has gained all of that. And glory to come. We could could elaborate on, on, on the blessings that the Lord has gained for us for the rest of the hour. An understanding of grace and an appreciation of salvation is essential for us. We need to understand that. We need to understand the very things that Paul is extolling here when he speaks of the gospel for a variety of reasons, but in in light of this aspect of confessing and our failure to confess, understanding these things gives courage and it gives enthusiasm and it causes us to want to speak about it. To go places other than here. 
across the globe or down to Cuba or wherever and speak the gospel to others. That, what drives that is a love for the Lord and an appreciation for what He's done for us. Well, it does give courage and steadfastness. There are many examples of that. One that I love is uh, that of the old Bishop Polycarp who was being led to the arena to be thrown to the lions to, when, when this was going on, two officials tried to persuade him to deny Christ and call Caesar Lord. Save yourself, they said. But Polycarp refused. He said, for 86 years I have served Christ and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? And then he added, bring what you will. He saved me. That's what we are to confess. That's the gospel. And in verse 11, Paul gives more scripture to support it. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Now that's Isaiah 28 verse 16. It's the passage that Paul quoted at the end of chapter 9 where Christ is called a stone. Israel stumbled over that stone. Israel stumbled over Christ. But those who trust in Him, Isaiah said, are not disappointed. Notice it is believes in Him. Saving faith is not just a confession or a statement of truth. It is faith in a person. It's faith in a doctrine. It's faith in... in the statements of Scripture. It's faith in the Word of God, but that Word is about a person. And to truly understand what the Gospel is, what the Word is that we believe, we understand that it's about a living person, which is just part of the confession that he has has spoken of here. It's in a person. And faith involves three things. Knowledge, first of all. We have to understand what it's about. That's about the person and work of Jesus Christ, who He is, what He did, that He's God and man, and that He offered Himself up as a sacrifice. He bore the punishment that we all deserve. It involves knowledge, and then it involves assent. In other words, that one agrees with that. I understand it. I I agree that it's true. But then thirdly, it involves trust, which Calvin defined as a firm and effectual confidence. I'm trusting it. I'm confident in it. I'm resting in it. That's that's faith. Our, Our confidence is in the person of Christ who is alive, who is the Savior, and who will never, never disappoint the believer. Disappointed. That word means, or can mean, as well as just the idea of disappoint, be ashamed. Um, and it, it speaks of what occurs when, when the guilt of sin is exposed. And when that happens, a person is ashamed. Uh, that's what it produces. But the believer will never experience that. Never be disappointed. Never be put to shame. That's the promise. No believer will come to the end and discover that the blood of Christ was not sufficient for him or her. And the promise is for whoever believes or whosoever believeth, as the King James puts it. So not only is the gospel near and salvation easily accessible, but it is also equally accessible to all who believe, whoever they may be, whosoever. This is what Paul explains in verse 12. Jew and Gentile alike receive salvation through faith. There is no distinction, he says. Now, this is a great statement of grace because for centuries it seemed that there was a distinction and the advantage was with the Jews. And it was. There was that distinction, and the advantage was altogether with Israel. Paul listed the privileges that set them apart from the nations at the beginning of this, this 
section of the book of Romans in chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. The adoption as sons, they had that. The Gentiles didn't have that. The glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, that was all Israel's. That wasn't the Gentiles. The temple and other things, other blessings, many other blessings. Gentiles had none of these. They were strangers to the blessings. They were outside of the covenants, living in spiritual darkness, sin and ignorance, lost and utterly helpless. But through the death of Christ and his resurrection, Christ has ended the law. He broke down the wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile. He opened up salvation to all the nations making it available to both Jew and Gentile alike. So, God's grace is worldwide in its scope. It goes beyond a nation and out to the nations. That's the breadth of God's grace. But in this, we also get a sense of the depth of God's grace. Because there's no distinction, not only nationally, ethnically, which gives us a sense of the width, the breadth of His grace, it's for all of the nations, but also ethically, morally, because all are sinners. The the Gentiles were notorious for that, for their depraved behavior. The, The Jews, on the other hand, were guilty of hypocrisy. Paul explained all of that back in chapters 1 and 2 of of this book when when he's establishing the guilt of mankind and the need of the gospel. All are sinners is what he concludes in chapter 3. There's no distinction. Jewish advantages didn't make them better. All need a Savior and all need the Savior equally because all are equally spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins. That's mankind. And God has been equally gracious in giving His Son for both the Jew and the Gentile, for all kinds of people. Paul explains further, there is no distinction for the same Lord is Lord of all. There is one God over all, and so, because there's one God over all, there's one way of salvation for all. The the Lord is Christ, verse 9. That's part of the confession. He is God. And He saves all the same way, with the same invitation. He is abounding in riches for all who call on His name, Paul says. Now that's the teaching of Scripture. When I say Scripture, I mean all of Scripture. That's the teaching of the Old Testament. This isn't some novel idea dreamed up by the Apostle Paul, something foreign to the the rest of Scripture that the prophets would, would not have known what Paul was talking about. No, he's quoting them. He supports everything that he says here in this passage from Scripture. And here, his statement is supported from The prophet Joel in verse 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter quoted that text on the day of Pentecost because Joel prophesied that God would pour out His Spirit on all mankind with the result result that whosoever or whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Joel chapter 2 verse 23. God has made the gospel and grace and salvation accessible to all who believe. He has not made it difficult. He has not given us heavy tasks to perform, steps to crawl up on our knees, or pilgrimages to make make across the globe to go search and seek and try to uncover the truth. Not at all. It's here. It's present. It's accessible to all. Just call on His name. That's the task that's been given. Believe. From the early chapters of the Bible, we read of men doing that. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. 
They began to acknowledge Him and worship Him. They believed in Him. This is nothing new. The gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, goes back to the very beginning. In the New Testament, it refers to trusting in Him, calling on the name of the Lord. It referred to that as well back then. Calling on Him for salvation. Calling on His name. And His name, we've talked about this, I think, many times. I've explained this. I'm explaining it again. The name represents the person. We don't really have that in our culture. But in the Bible, you see that Abraham defined, that name defined him. And then the, the name of the Lord defined him, explained him. And so the name represents the person who's called upon. It represents who he is and what he will do. The name of the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, designates Christ as God. And the name Jesus tells us what He will do. His name means the Lord is salvation or the Lord saves. That's how the angel explained it. The name itself defines itself. But the angel to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21 gave that explanation. You'll name him Jesus, this child that Mary was carrying, because he will save his people from his sins. That's what the name means. So calling on his name is calling to him and calling for him to save. Peter gives us a great example of that in Matthew chapter 14 when Christ is coming to the disciples in an unusual moment and place. He's walking to them on the Sea of Galilee, walking on the water. And Peter was so taken up by it that, that he walked out onto the water himself, stepped out of the boat and began to walk across the sea. And you know what happened. It's one of the most uh, well-known incidents in the Gospels. He took his eye off Christ. While he had his eye on Christ, he was fine. But when he began to look at the waves and realize, I'm, I'm doing what's impossible. Then, of course, he sunk and was in danger of drowning. And at that moment, he cried out, Lord, save me. That's calling upon the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. And Christ did. The text says, immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. Christ saves all who call to Him, whoever that may be. There's no distinction among men. And there's no conflict in Paul's teaching. In chapter 9, he taught, It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. He has mercy on whom He desires, and He hardens whom He desires. That's the God of Romans 9. And He's the God of Romans 10. Salvation is all of God, but man is responsible to believe in order to receive his salvation. I think it's interesting as you study the book of Romans and you study those, these two chapters, 9 and 10, to notice how, how Paul moves so freely from divine sovereignty and salvation in chapter 9 to human responsibility in chapter 10. He saw no conflict between the two. And there is none. We may not understand it altogether, but there's no conflict. Man's response of faith is the way that God's choice in election is achieved. The elect are chosen to believe. And God offers salvation freely to whosoever believes. God has, has not made it hard. He has made His grace in the gospel accessible to all who will, all who will trust in Him. So if I could borrow the, uh, the language of Moses to make my point, do not say in your heart, I may not be elect. God has passed me by. He has made salvation inaccessible to me. That's not true. You don't know that. No, election is what makes salvation possible. The Word is near you. You don't have to 
try to, to do the impossible, to scale the heavens, to, to search the depths to find it. It's in Christ. That's where it is. Believe. Still, that, that seems too simple for some. Men do have a strange infatuation with the law. They want to be a Hercules and win their salvation by some, some great work, some, some magnificent achievement, some great effort. Naaman was like that. He was a great Syrian general who became a leper. But he had an Israelite servant girl who told him about a prophet in Samaria who could heal him. So Naaman went to Elisha. And the prophet told the Syrian to go wash in the Jordan River seven times and he would be restored and clean. Well, Naaman was offended by that. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel? And so he left in a rage. But he had some wise servants and they stopped him and they said to him, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Well, yeah, he would have done that. Well, how much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? It's simple. Well, Naaman saw the wisdom. He took their counsel. He went to the Jordan. He washed in it seven times and was so completely restored that his skin became like that of a little child. And he was clean, the text says. Do you want to be clean? And call on the name of the Lord. Pray, Lord, save me. And he will. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If you feel your shame is too great, that you must do some, something, some Herculean task to atone, don't believe it. You can't. You cannot. Christ can, Christ has, He's done it all. He has taken our shame and sin and guilt, He has paid for it, and He has, has removed it all. Trust in Him. He saves all who do with full assurance. No ifs, no if you do this, you'll inherit the world, no. No uncertainties, it's who ever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. May God help you to do that if you haven't. And you who have, I hope it's everybody in here. Rejoice. Rejoice in what He's done for you and be so encouraged that you confess Him before men. I hope we'll all do that. I include myself in that. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you give us courage and boldness before the world. We have every reason for that. You've saved us. If we're believers in your Son, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, if we've called upon the name of the Lord, we have been justified, declared righteous, clothed in white, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and that can never change and never be removed. And you are presently working to change us and transform us into the image of Christ. You're sanctifying us. Father, we're still weak. We don't see things as we should. We need, as Paul prayed for those Ephesian believers, to have the eyes of our hearts opened so that we understand more and understand more clearly. We pray for all of that and that you'd galvanize us with courage to represent you faithfully and well before the world. We have a great message, a message of salvation for the lost. Make us vocal about it. Thank you for Christ, for his death for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.